Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin, throughout the stars did we go wandering. Distance was no barrier, and time it had no hope. Free to go. And welcome to Karmic Evolutions Astrologically Speaking. I'm your host, Sherry Horn Hassan of Karmic Evolution from Contact Radio, with just a quick reminder that this show aims to bring you the truth about astrology and your soul's karmic evolution. Today, my guest is professional astrologer Diane Lawson, who I will, of course, be introducing properly in just a few moments. First, my usual housekeeping stuff. You can listen to Karmic Evolutions Astrologically Speaking anytime by simply going to my website at karmicevolution.com, clicking on the banner, the upper right-hand portion of the banner, which is labeled Radio Show. From that page, you can scroll down and just hear the most recent show, which is uh, highlighted, or listen to any of the archived recordings of past shows, things you may have missed or things you might want to re-listen to again. Separately... Do me the favor, if you would, of following me on my Facebook page, which is Karmic Evolution for Your Soul. And it's there you can also sign up for my Conversations About Consciousness newsletter as well. And finally, I'm offering still my one-hour discounted Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading to my listeners only for $99. If you want to gain greater consciousness about your soul's true mission and purpose in this lifetime, move from chaos to clarity in your relationships, career, finances, or the areas of health, heal old karmic wounds and co-create your own future happiness and success, and awaken to your true potential and highest destiny in this lifetime, well, that's easy when you take advantage of this special discounted offer for listeners. Again, a one-hour Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading for only $99. Simply email me, that's Sherry, S-H-E-R-I, at karmicevolution.com and book your reading today. At almost half the regular price, conscious awareness has never been so easy or so affordable. Okay, now let's get into this week's astro news you can use. So as most of us know, we're in the waning portion of the monthly lunar cycle since the Pisces full moon asked us to release a couple of things when it occurred on September 20th. And these include any attachment to rigid control of our environment, shame, blame, or guilt based on an erroneous assumption or misconception, whether conscious or unconsciously driven, that we are imperfect and therefore unworthy of receiving love or, you know, anything else for that matter. And our need to have to prove everything factually without acknowledging that just because you can't see something, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In other words, to let go of not trusting our intuition or our intuitive senses. However, this message is likely to be confusing because the moon met Neptune exact at about 12 hours before this lunation and both of them oppose the sun. And there's a conundrum here. Because the moon and Neptune and Pisces opposite the sun is an energy that can be easily deceived. And since it's usually Virgo that has the factually grounding answers, why would we want to let go of that portion of Virgo energy, right? So the last thing that I said, you know, the need to prove everything factually, but that we need to let go of it and trust our intuition, it's confusing because we don't want to do that if it causes uh, if we do it through some kind if we confuse our intuition with self-deceit 
right? Because it's then that we usually end up getting swindled somehow. Now, in today's world, of course, with all this division, divisiveness that's been going on for the past few years, we don't want to forego facts for fantasy because that can ultimately get us in trouble. So when the moon and Neptune reminded the Virgo sun to let go of its empirically driven need for proof, it was saying we should trust our gut, but again, to recognize the difference between what's really coming from our gut and self-deceit, because it's self-deceit that's often the culprit if and when we realize that we thought we were following our gut intuition, but the result ended up not being a really happy one. And that's the conundrum that this lunation has left us with. And again, in a perfect world, trusting our intuition is the name of the game, especially when we factor in practical, factual reality. So hence, this Pisces new moon was particularly fatiguing for some and confusing for others. And the answer is always to go to a higher place outside all of the noise and opinions and perceptions of the outside world and to really receive your own answers from that higher place rather than allowing mundane influences to lead us astray. So the fatigue and confusion of earlier this week at the exact lunation is starting to dissipate already as we're called now to integrate these two polarities, the Neptune, Pisces and, Pisces and uh, Virgo, so that neither one dominates the other and we can find an ultimate happy balance, especially since we entered Libra season yesterday on September 22nd when the sun moved into the sign of Libra. Libra, the sign of partnership. And what's the best kind of partnership? Balanced, harmonious, peaceful, and loving, right? But just prior to the sun's move into Venus ruled Libra, Mercury in Libra squared Pluto and Capricorn. Now, some of us may have felt that square. I know I did. This was the kind of energy where we can get angry, caught up in obsessive thoughts or thinking, and, and or simply try to control others through power plays, particularly, of course, through our communications. So anything from a snarky remarks that we can't seem to shake off to outright arguments between people kind of set the tone of this aspect. It's like someone saying something nasty to us, and then we spend the next 12 hours trying to figure out a comeback. Or maybe we did have a snappy comeback, but now we spent the time obsessing about a better one or, you know, whether or not to say it or just forget the whole damn thing. But again, since we're in the waning phase of the Pisces full moon, which asks us still to let go of thinking we can control our environment, we can ask ourselves, how does forcing our opinions or philosophies on others serve us now? How do we rise to the challenge of the full moon's request to intuit our real and true answers and Mercury square Pluto's challenge to either stand our ground or let others push us around? This will become important as Mercury moves into its retrograde period starting September 26 or 27 when he stations at 25 degrees 28 minutes of Libra and will re-square Pluto again on October 1st while retrograde, and then a final time in the sequence when he's direct on November 2nd. Now, guys, I'm hearing a lot of distortion on this line, and I don't know if it's coming through to the live or not, but um, I'm hoping my engineer is on top of this because there seems to be a lot of background noise. Um, anyway, I will, um, I will continue. So let's go back to the true Libra and archetype for a moment. As the sun now joins Mercury and Mars and partnership-oriented, Cardinal Airy Libra. Though about relationships, Libra's the sign of social relating. Because it's also a cardinal sign, it's about initiating. So Libra energy likes to initiate conversations that allow balance and harmony between two individuals or parties through dialogue. And it's through such dialogue that both parties can become aware of the other's point of view. Once openly aired and discussed, now it's possible for them to negotiate together. However, what's negotiated ultimately results in a compromise between the two. Clearly, this is necessary in our personal lives, in both intimate and business partnerships, as it is in the wider screen of our community and our collective lives. Libra is the reason we have treaties between nations to promote 
uh, both to promote harmony and goodwill. Again, read balance, you know, such as in the trade agreements where, you know, uh, goods and services are are transmitted between parties uh, and there are rules and regulations and agreements that are in place as to how to do this in a fair and balanced way and a sense that both parties know where they stand, even if such information is used as a deterrent. So we have things like nuclear treaty agreements, right? So the agreement is about not um, allowing one party to do harm to another. Now, the downside of Libra energy can be one that affects us more personally. It's when we don't feel whole without a partner. And because of this, we compromise without really no negotiation. Those who carry Libra and energy often get, often get labeled people pleasers. And that means we may give up without a fight simply to avoid conflict. So when we're conflict averse, often we'd rather negotiate than state our case. And we simply end up acquiescing to the strongest voice in the room. The important part to understand here, though, is that this tendency revolves around Libra's fear of being alone. I said before, the Libra archetype doesn't feel whole without a partner. So then once a decision is made, one in which the Libra person has allowed another to run the show, unhappiness sets in at not getting one's way. And this becomes like a slow kind of dance. Oh, yes, I see your point. You're right. Okay, let's just do it your way. Later, however, when your way annoys, angers, or even enrages the Libra person, they're caught in a kind of web whereby they can't now protest because they already allow the other party what to, well, run the show. <laughs> so what often happens is that those who carry Libra and energy tend to become angry but not express their anger. And this results in what's known as passive-aggressive behavior. When anyone catches themselves saying through gritted teeth, okay, 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 that's fine, we know something's going on between the surface, and that's not conducive to us being truly honest with ourselves about what makes us happiest. Finally, because the uh, Libra archetypal energy can hear and understand both sides of an argument, discussion, or what have you, this results in confusion and indecisiveness on a personal level. Um, my, my example is, you know, you're with a friend at a restaurant and they say, I can't decide what to have. Everything on this menu looks so good. And clearly that's not a big deal. But when it comes to choosing a job, committing to a relationship, buying, a, you know, making a large purchase like a home or a car or making a move in life, it can become a very big deal. So Libra energy can result in fence sitting, meaning one never really makes a final decision, thus setting up the same scenario, which is that someone else will decide. And down the road, the passive aggressive tendencies come out to play. So a balance between the need for partnership and to express one's personal will, and this is the zodiacal opposite energy inherent in Libra's polar opposite sign of Aries, needs to be established. That's Libra's goal in terms of growing in consciousness. We might ask ourselves now during this Libra season, do I acquiesce to others because I have trouble making a decision? And if so, why is making a decision difficult? Am I afraid of taking responsibility, making the wrong decision, people judging my decision, or the other party, um, you know, um, saying no and thus leaving me still to feel like, you know, there's no unity in this partnership or that the other person is is viewing me as the one who's pigheaded or always trying to get my way. And then finally, how can I learn to be more assertive without fearing I'll lose this relationship, be it an intimate one, a friendship or business related? So um, as you guys know, I always like to connect what's going on in the collective with the astrological energies in play. Watch the negotiations now and next week in the U.S. Congress as both the legislators in the House and the Senate try to strike deals on President Biden's proposed infrastructure legislation, which carries a hefty $3.5 price tag 
and includes raising corporate taxes and those on the already wealthy. Now, again, this brings back into play what I mentioned earlier, which is the Pluto square, um, I'm sorry, Mercury and Libra square Pluto in Capricorn that we just experienced and will experience again in October, on October 1st and November, I forget what I said, I think November 2nd, right? So we're looking at another month plus, right? Where, because Mercury is going to retrograde on the 27th in Libra, we're going to review, we're going to revise, we're going to rethink any negotiations that were previously confirmed or made or that are still in play. So as we do this, we're going to see this Mercury square Pluto rear its head again and challenge us to say, all right, are we going to acquiesce for the sake of compromise in ways that make us happy enough so that we will not experience um, passive aggressive behavior after the fact? And will we be really, you know, happy with the solution, at least over the short term? Because Libra energy is going to always be about continuously negotiating and compromising, as anyone who's in a long-term relationship knows. And it remains to be seen if the waxing Mars and Libra trying to Saturn in Aquarius, which culminates this week on September 21st, I'm sorry, 25th, will allow them the energy to do the hard, exacting mental work necessary to pare down this legislation's price tag to the satisfaction of all. Now, the deal is that the Senate passed the $1 trillion infrastructure bill, which is the hard infrastructure bill for roads and bridges and, uh, um, you know, road repairs, bridges, and um, what's the other big infrastructure, you know, um, highways. No, roads, bridges, and why have I lost my train of thought? Oh, anyway. I'm hearing background noise. That's why. Anyway, so um, there's pretty much agreement. That bill passed the Senate, and it's in the House now. But the Senate Democrats have a dispute between the moderates and the progressives, right? So this is an intra-party dispute. And that dispute is about whether or not to tie the $1 trillion infrastructure bill, which the House would probably pass, Together with the 3.5 trillion um, soft infrastructure bill, which is being called the human infrastructure bill, which funds things like um, pre-K, universal pre-K for all children in this country, uh, supplemental assistance for child care for those who are working or those who are ill or elder and, and care for the elderly companions, as well as adding things to Medicare for seniors like dental coverage and uh, hearing aids and things of that nature, which are not included um, now. Now, young people don't think about that, but those of us who are getting a little older do. So, um, you know, hopefully more than wishful thinking will prevail when Venus and Scorpio trines Neptune and Pisces by September 29th, because this is a very compassionate energy. It's one that allows us to feel other people and to have compassion for them. So as these two things kind of, uh, you know, go hand in hand and the Mars trine Saturn allows people to actually read the thousands of pages of legislation that they get presented with before they have to vote on it and digest it and make, you know, calculated and sensible conclusions and ask, you know, the, the right questions and Venus it trine Neptune, which follows also brings about a sense of, you know, our, our that, that no man is an island, empathetic, I can walk a mile in your shoes kind of energy. So we shall see, you know, as always, what, what occurs. But um, now, um, as we move along, I would like to introduce this week's guest to talk more about um, this Libra season. So Diane Lawson, professional astrologer, author, and teacher for the past 47 years, has counseled thousands of clients to help them create the lives they desire. She counts among her clients a United States governor, a Pulitzer Prize winner, several Tony Award winners, and a number of prominent authors and business people. 
Her more colorful clients have included prostitutes and criminals. No stranger to radio and podcast interviews, Diane's presented hundreds of classes, workshops, and talks. Also, the author of the book, Extraordinary Relationships Through Astrology, Diane has contributed articles to more than 100 astrological publications and additional publications such as Fate, Toastmaster, and various Christian-oriented children's magazines. A member of High IQ Society's Mensa and Intertel, Diane lives in Topeka, Kansas, from where she counsels clients locally and afar via phone, email, and the Internet. She may be reached through her website at dianelawson.com. So, hi, Diane. Welcome back to the show. Well, hello. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. I'm excited about having you. I know that, you know, one of your uh, your main focuses with the astrology is relationships. So it's a better time than when the sun is in Libra and we also have this upcoming Mercury retrograde in Libra. Um, now, I wanted to mention to everyone listening first that I did interview back about, I did interview about your book, again, Extraordinary Relationships to Astrology, back on May 21st, 2020. So if anyone wants to listen or re-listen to this show, please feel free to go to Karmic Evolutions Radio Show, again, on the upper right-hand corner of the banner of the site, and scroll down to this archived recording. Um, now, however, I'd like to get to some current astrology, given the fact that one of your main focuses, again, is relationship astrology, and the Mercury, again, is about to station retrograde and Libra, the sign of partnership. <laughs> so if you're ready, here goes. My first, I'm ready. <laughs> oh, my God, I knew you would be. Given the fact that the world is in such a state of disharmony right now, and then Mercury and Libra is about communicating with partner, what's your take on the bottom line meaning of this Mercury retrograde period coming up in the Eric Cardinal sign of Libra? Well, I think, I think this is going to give us the opportunity to correct how we communicate with people. Um, you know, as you were talking about, Libra is a sign of um, communication and relationships, and retrograde Mercury uh, is looking inward, word, figuring out how we can redo or rethink or reevaluate. It's a good opportunity for us to kind of take a breath and try to think before we speak and improve our communication and improve any misunderstandings we've had with people in the past, and I, I see it as a time to be focusing on ourselves. I think um, retrograde planets are looking within, and we have to look at what was our part in any miscommunications. What are we doing that might contribute to that? Um, and you were mentioning the labor part is the balance. Uh, how much do we give too much to others? How much do we take too much? How how are we selfish? How to how to figure out a balance in letting us um, live with each other and communicate with each other? And and so I think it's an opportunity. I think life is is always made up of the choices we make. And I think the universe is now giving us opportunities to rethink some of our choices we've made in the past with communication. And you also mentioned balance. Labor is about balance. We need to think about our talking too much. Are we listening too much and not saying our truth and try to have a balance thinking of others, but also thinking of ourselves. So I think it's a, I think it's a good opportunity for us. And it's, it's, whether or not we take it is up to us. Right, as always, right? You know, I'm mindful. It's funny. I was going to say this in the, my remarks, but um, um, I didn't, obviously. Um, I'm mindful of um, a webinar that Kimberly Weimer of Evolutionary Astrology Network, who is an astrologer, did when Jupiter was in Libra which was in, I think, from September of 2015 to October of 2000, no, I'm sorry, September of 2016, I think it was, till October, uh, yes, of 2017, right? And that was obviously in the U.S., at least our last presidential, not the last one, but the presidential election that put um, President Trump in office and the um, following year when there was so much divisiveness, right? And she was talking about how Jupiter is the planet of expansion, but in Libra, 
instead of expanding partnership, it actually pulled partnerships apart, you know? So it always struck me as interesting because it's not the normal way that you think of Libra, right? But I'm just wondering, too, if you feel that, you know, given what you're saying, that we're to review and rethink our previous conversations, negotiations, and commitments within partnerships, that that the message given what I just said about Jupiter and, you know, that seemed to be the trajectory we've been on, right, since 2016, 17 at least, that that this will play out positively within the collective. Because, again, regular listeners to my show know that I say that the collective is what we can look to to then extract from it those energies, right, what's happening on the major world screen. We can filter down to which ones are actually in play in our own lives. So the collective is sort of like the big story, and then we can put it down into our, our own um, individual stories. So do you, you do, are you hopeful? Uh, well, first of all, I believe one of the universal laws is, and it's called something else, but as I think of it as the law of ebb and flow. I think everything ebbs and flows. You know, we had uh, George W. Bush, and then we had Obama, and then we had Trump, and now we have Biden. I mean, the, the world was certainly ebbing and flowing during, or the, the U.S. was certainly ebbing and flowing through those presidencies from one inch to another. And I think, I think we're in, in a real time of, um, of um, chaos and dissension and disagreement. And I think it will, will go back to being more nice to each other and more together, but. I think it's going to take a long time. I, you know, we've got we've got a lot of stuff going on, um, which is a lot more powerful than just just uh, Mercury and Libra. I, I don't I don't think it's going to get better uh, for quite a while. Yeah, you know, we've got countries Pluto return coming up. We, we've just got a lot of heavy stuff, and um, it's going to take a lot more <laughs> than than you know. Um, what we have in the sky right now for things to get better, I think. But we still have to individually each do our turn and always try to be more loving and always try to be more thoughtful. Right, right. No, I, yeah, I mean, that makes good sense. We have obviously the Saturn square still going on and, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, other things, but, um, you, yeah, you just sort of, took me where I was going to go, which is in terms of our individual partnerships, right? Whether they're with significant others, family members, friends, colleagues, bosses, whatever. Um, just to focus a little more on the, the Mercury retrograde period, which is short, right? Um, do you think, especially with Mercury going to re-square Pluto again twice and, and also he's going to retry and um, um, what is he going to be? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes and I wrote retrines Mercury. So Mercury is not going to retrine Mercury. So whatever I had on the third, what is he going to do? Oh, he's going to retrine Jupiter. Sorry. Um, and then he'll requeen Kung Fu on the October 5th. This is all short term, right? And we can join Mars on October 9th. And that's going to follow the sun's conjunction to Mars as well on the on the eighth of October, and then he'll re you know he's just redoing his path, and then he's going to requinquen re Uranus, and we know quincunx is our adjustments on October eleventh. So is this a better time to get what we want if we're going to review our relationships and communications within within them, you know, with an eye towards reaching a better, uh, more harmonious, negotiated compromise? Or is it better to respond to others more? I mean, what, what is the balance here? What is this guy telling us with this retrograde? Well, I, I think I think there is so much going on astrologically right now. And one of the things we haven't mentioned is so many of the outer planets going retrograde right now. It it that's not a necessarily a good time to go forward. And then the big thing that's going on this year, I think, um, is Saturn square Uranus. And I think it's in effect the whole calendar year of 20, 
21, even though it kind of ebbs and flows out of the exact square. But that's causing, I think that is what's causing the uh, huge, dis- one of the things that's causing the huge dissension. And then with Neptune and Pisces causing confusion and what we're, Neptune and Pisces, I think, is what we're supposed to be doing is learning how to be more spiritual and more unconditionally loving. But you mentioned all this stuff going on, you know, this <laughs> um, this fall. I, I think we need to balance between getting what we want and forging compromises. And sometimes you really need to work on a compromise. Oh, you need to go for it, what you think is true. <laughs> we can hear you in the background hon can you mute your mic um sorry go ahead okay well you were talking the mercury re-squaring pluto um that's probably a good time to try to keep our mouth shut because (laughs) we could be kind of emotional or really argumentative or really angry and I may mark my calendar and not try to make any important, um, you know, phone calls or conversations. Uh, a lot of 12-step programs teach people to halt, H-A-L-T, uh, don't have important conversations when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you know, which is which um, the first letters of those are H-A-L-T. So I think maybe on around... October 1, we should, you know, put ourselves to bed and not have important conversations if we're hungry, angry, angry, lonely, or tired, especially. Um, Octor, and then the quincunx to Neptune, um, we may not have all the information, or we may be self-deluded, or we may be confused, and that's not a necessarily a good time. And then when it's Reconjoining Mars, my gosh, you know, that can be very argumentative, too. So, oh, it's just, I, it's often a better time to listen, but try to be loving. I mean, that's the key, I think, for all of this, is, you know, um, try, to be, try to be loving and um, listen to others. And, and we we have to try to have compromise, but not all the time. You know, sometimes we try not, we just probably shouldn't even try to communicate, but others we should speak our truth and, and, um, stick with it. So it's, and, and the trick is to know when to do what, and it's pretty hard. Right. Which goes, which leads us back to, you know, trusting our gut, but in a way that's actually, you know, um, that we can actually ensure that the messages we're getting intuitively are, are really true ones for ourselves, you know, and not influenced by outside um, opinions or perceptions, like I said before. Because it seems like that's what's so confusing right now. I think it's funny that I was mentioning that the bill, the infrastructure bill that everyone seems to agree on, has to do with um, expanding internet access, right, throughout the nation, right, to rural areas and all that, and, and especially, you know, um, since the pandemic, had so many children having to communicate with their teachers and classes via, you know, uh, the internet. And, um, then I think, well, that could be a nightmare because there's so much disinformation and misinformation through the internet that why do we want to increase that, right? So this is kind of funny. But let me, um, pinpoint something you, you mentioned, which is that, um, Pluto, that we have a lot of retrograde energy in the sky right now, but fairly shortly, in the next two weeks, Pluto is going to station direct in Capricorn on October 6th. Saturn will station in Aquarius direct on October 9th, 10th. And Jupiter stations direct October 17th and 18th, which is basically the day, the, the 18th. I mean, 17th, 18th depends on your time zone. Um, but Mercury is scheduled to station direct October 18th, too. So, do you think that this will improve any of, uh, you know, um, um, it, will it have an, a fortuitous effect going forward on anything that's revised, rethought, renegotiated, recompromised during Mercury's retrograde period? Well, I've got to go back and I don't know if I would use... Um, Positive or negative with Mercury retrograde. Um, I, and I know I have, 
you know, I send out emails uh, to my clients, and the number one email I send out every year is always about Mercury retrograde, because Mercury retrograde really strikes fear into the hearts of a lot of my clients. And and I, I write Mercury Retrograde on my email, and my gosh, they just swarm, and op- everybody opens it, and they get all excited. But Mercury Retrograde is just as, as important, and I think just can be just as positive as Mercury Direct, but you have to look at them differently. I think maybe we can um, go forward more easily with with all this direct energy um and one but you know i will not take passport travel i will not do passport travel or send new manuscripts to new publishers or editors under mercury retrograde but i will do kind of daily kinds of things or i will redo i will certainly edit and i will re- try to reestablish uh, relationships and so I, I think it's it might be easier to move forward but I don't I, I want to stress to the people that are listening that Mercury or any of the retrograde planets don't necessarily mean negative or mean that you have to hide under the bed so I, I, I think in answer to your question yes I think it is easier to move forward but um, I don't want to have people think, well, I I think that retrograde stuff is a negative thing. Right, right, nor do I, and I've talked about that before on the show. I mean, one of the things I think is in my mind, actually, is that um, I talked about Jupiter when it reached the midway point of its retrograde period, and how old plans that um, it became, it becomes obvious at that point that old plans that are not going to work out for whatever reason are going to be jettisoned and that allows us for the second half of Mercury's retrograde period to start to form new plans and so when Jupiter stations direct now on the 17th or 18th we can start to implement those plans you know so I'm thinking and just as you say I mean the wider backdrop of course is the outer planets transits Mercury I'm sorry um, Neptune and Pisces and, and um, Pluto and Cap and Uranus and Taurus but we excuse me also have um, Jupiter being able to allow us to say okay whatever I thought I was going to do I realized isn't practical or isn't going to work or I don't have the money for it or whatever and now I've I've chucked it or I've revived it which can happen also during this Mercury retrograde period, right? And then, you know, say, oh, okay, now I've got the plan. Now I'm going to figure out either how to implement it or that's what I just figured out. I figured out the plan and the implementation, or now I'm going to work on the implementation, you know? So, uh, but I don't see retrogrades as negative either. I never do. I see them on a more psychological level of our ability to go inward, you know, and to check in, with the, with the soul, you know, the wisdom of the soul. So that's how I roll. But I'm wondering now, you might indulge me and have a look at President Joe Biden's chart to see what you make of Mercury's retrograde period there. And for those who don't know, I'm just going to give the chart data. Uh, Biden was born November 20th, 1942, at 8.30 a.m. in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And what we can see at a quick glance which interested me is that Venus's Libra rules his 11th house. And I use the classic uh, chart calculation. So, um, but um, the 11th house in mundane astrology represents the legislature. And Mercury is going to station there at 25 degrees, 28 minutes, square to his natal 8th house, Jupiter, which is 25 degrees, 8 minutes of Cancer. And since Mercury will swim to 10 degrees, 23 minutes of Libra before he stations direct again on October 18th. And that's true for all of us. We can all check our charts to see where those degrees are and what Mercury is going to aspect. Um, He'll also cross back over Biden's 19-degree Libra 11 plus. So he's going to go 9 degrees back into his 10th house. You know, if he's only going 2 or 3 degrees, that would be a little different. The 10th house is, of course, among other things, our reputation. So I'm wondering if you have any guesses on how this might affect communication and relationships, particularly with his old friends and others in the legislature. You know, he 
seeks again to pass the major legislative infrastructure initiative now. Well, first of all, I, w- I would just want to say a, a couple of things about Biden and his chart. Um, you know, he was in he was in Congress for I don't, probably more than any other president ever. You know, he's, he was elected senator when he was 29, and he became a senator was when he was 30. So he had a lot of years of experience. And he also, if you look at his chart, my gosh, he is he's got. Um, Four planets in Scorpio, and then he has not only that, he has Mercury, Sun, and Venus in Scorpio in the the twelfth house. So he certainly is a master at working behind the scenes. And he, and also with four things in Scorpio, he's a master of being a steam roller and working and working and working until he gets whatever he wants done. So I have, I think you always have to kind of look at the birth chart. But you ask about what he what he would do with I just want to point out real quickly, because uh, you mentioned it, is that that stellium, and I would include Mars in the 12th house, at least in Placid, because it's really only degree, degree and a half away, but is that they try the natal Jupiter that I mentioned, that Mercury is going to square, and they also square his na- natal nodes, which are 29 Aquarius in the third house to the Leo north node in the ninth. So I just want to mention that. But thank you for bringing that up. Well, you know, we... You- that Jupiter uh, in Cancer is exalted. It means Jupiter works really well in in Cancer, and and um, so I think I think um, I think he. You ask about what he was, how he was going to do with Congress, and I think he's going to work very well with with the Democrats. And you were talking about the progressives and the moderates are going to have to come together. Um, but he he spent so much time serving in Congress. He knows how how that how you do that, how you do the background deals, or you know back. Um, ground deals, what's the word, you know, <laughs> with the, kind of behind the scenes. He's going to work very, very well with the Democrats, and he's going to get them together. There's no way he can work with the Republicans. Um, you know, 78% of Republicans do not think he is the legitimate pro- president, and there's nothing he can do to get them to vote his way, but he's got the votes. So I think he's going to be... Um, and passing both of those infrastructure bills, both the hard one with the highways and the bridges and so on, and the uh, the human one, which has to do with the child tax credit and and so on. Um, so I think I think he's going to get what he wants with with um, Congress, and I think he's going to do that. And then you mentioned reputation. I don't see that his reputation is going to go one way or the other. I think Democrats are going to continue to like him, and Republicans are going to continue not to. You know, it's interesting. I've been reading the Bob Woodward and Bob Costa book, Carol. I'm probably about halfway through it. And uh, I think it was last night I was reading the section where, um, well, two things. One was about the earlier part was about COVID when he first came in was, you know, after the inauguration. The second part was the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And, you know, Virgo, Mercury's Virgo rules in heaven. I thought it's super interesting because apparently he asks a bazillion questions and, you know, drills, not, he doesn't drill people, but he's like, you know, what about this and what about that and what about this and what about that and what about the other thing? And I thought, you know, I'm a Virgo rising with a sixth house mark, so I love that, you know. I'm like, well, this guy is not uninformed because he asks all the questions. And, you know, Virgo is so practical, right? I mean, you know, being able to say, um, use the logic and, and he's asking everyone for analysis and then, you know, um, really thinking about what his analysis is of all their analysis. So I think that's really interesting. But I want to ask you, too, what I noticed in the chart as well is that his Mars is at 12 degrees and 20, no, 35 minutes Scorpio. And it's on the cusp of his 13 degree, 29 minutes. So, again, it's only a minute. Um, most of us would probably put Mars in the 12th house. But regardless, it's uh, been off and on opposed and squared. It's going to be square with the moving Saturn square to Uranus. 
And Uranus is, uh, you know, again, the cusp of 12th is 1329 Scorpio. So the cusp of 6th is 1329 Taurus. So Uranus has been hovering back and forth over that cusp. And Saturn has been squaring Mars. It's not square today because Saturn's still retrograde at 7 degrees Aquarius. Um, you know, what do you make of that? Because it's really pitting in this, this Mars energy, you know. Um, anything that you can tell us about what he's really facing here you know, in terms of this transit and the future? Well, I don't, I don't think, um, things are going to be easy for him. I think squares always show difficulty and, but I think with his chart, I mean, all that Scorpio, my gosh, you know, he, um, I think it's going to drive him um, even harder to get what he wants. Um, I think squares often are certainly hard and challenging, but I think they're going to give him a lot of driving force to um, continue getting um, what he wants for the country. Yeah, interesting. I didn't mention earlier, earlier today, the Venus and Scorpio opposition to Uranus, which also ties into this, right? Um, perfected at 14 Scorpio, uh, Taurus. And you know, that's a sudden change, but the, the, not, um, it can be a sudden change in relationships, right? So I was thinking of whether, you know, he's going to win over these progressive Democrats to compromise or win over the moderates to compromise or whatever. But also that the longer term Uranus opposite Mars, also squared by Saturn, which is that's such a frustrating energy. It's like Uranus wants Mars to really take off like a rocket, and Saturn's like, "Yo, wait a minute," you know. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, it's a frustrating, frustrating energy. I think when you know Saturn and Mars are in fictional aspects. So, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see. I'm I'm guessing that he himself is particularly frustrated. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that shows up in that in this book as well, you know. I, I don't know if I mentioned this before to the listeners, but Biden's chart lacks fire uh, as an element. And, you know, I've done some shows about that. I'm trying to remember if he has a singleton or no planets in fire, but he has um, uh, Pluto in, um, in um, Leo, and that's it. And I only use the nine major planets, and I don't use the angles when I look at that. So that is quick to anger, you know. So he's very calm and very um, even keeled and all that, but he does have a temper. And people, you know, have said that about him um, politically. So it's interesting to note that, you know, because um, it's it's sort of like I think he, he probably does have a fuse that once it's lit and that Uranus opposite the Mars is, is kind of interesting, right? Like how much does that ignite um, the frustration of the Saturn square to Mars and where does that take him, you know? But we'll see. I think, as you said, his ability to compromise and negotiate will probably win out, you know, uh, with the, especially with the people that are um, in cancer. Um, all right. Well, we're almost out of time. So what I want to ask you now is if you can share with everyone um, how they can keep track of what you're up to, your work, where they can buy your book, how they can join your mailing list, um, if they can, you know, where to go to the reading, stuff like that. Okay, well, thank you. I I think they can get everything I'd like for them to get or, or find out about me um, on my website. And you mentioned that earlier. It's uh, www dianelawson.com and this D-I-A-N-N-E-L-A-W-S-O-N and on my website they can sign up to get emails from me where I send out periodic information about astrology and a lot of it happens to be what's going on in the sky right now what's what's happening and how they can use it uh, for themselves personally as well as what might be going on in the world uh, it also, I also talk about when I'm going to be giving radio show, doing radio shows or podcasts so they can keep up and, and listen to that. I have a blog on my website where they can scroll down and get a lot of information. Um, it has what I do. It also has two things that hit, get more hits than anything else, and I have a pretty big section on Mercury retrograde. I always have the dates and then 
what what happens, what you can do, and what you can shouldn't be doing under Mercury retrograde. And then another section I have is one on astrology and the Bible, and that is just getting, for some reason, a huge number of hits, and I don't know why so many people are finding out about it now. But um, you can buy my book either on my website, my book, Extraordinary Relationships Through Astrology, um, or you can buy it on Barnes, at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And then, of course, you can also book a reading with me. It gives me, it gives you all the information about it, what I do, birth charts, yearly forecasts. I do horror astrology, which can answer any question, relocation, um, you know, pick a, pick a time for, wedding or whatever. So I, I have a lot of different services. And so my website is the place to go to find out about me, what I do, and also to find out a lot of information about astrology. So I hope people go there and um, see see all about it. Yeah, that's great. I'll remind everyone that in Diane's bio, she's uh, 47 years of practicing astrology, right? <laughs> And do it that one successfully without like knowing a thing or two, right? <laughs> so, um, highly recommend her. Um, I hope everybody checks out your website. And, um, again, thank you, Diane, and thanks to everyone else for joining us today. I hope that you've all found the information presented here helpful as you continue your karmic evolution in this lifetime. Please be sure to join me next week. September 23rd, uh, for another episode of Karmic Evolution's Astrological Speaking, when my guest will be Eileen McCabe, New York-based astrologer, who uh, will be talking about Pluto in Capricorn and Pluto transits and all things Pluto. So um, that's one you don't want to miss. But between now and then, until then, may your journey be filled with karmic healing and the joy of greater consciousness. Namaste. Long ago